Well, that was really weak. Well, I'm blessed. I'm okay. How are you today? Hey, Uncle Bobby. How you doing, buddy? It's good to see you. Good. Good. Can't complain. Well, we're glad you're here this morning. Amen? I would say, aren't you glad you're here not in jail, but that should be obvious anyway. We're going to, uh, we, we're, we don't have the choir up today. We're a little bit empty over here, so uh, uh, we're going to have to work on that, aren't we? Fill in just a little bit better. We had a bumper crowd last Sunday. It was fun to have a fuller, a fuller house than we've had in a little while. And I just uh, hope and pray for the Lord to continue blessing us and sending people our way. This morning, just prior to Sister Terry coming and bringing our announcements, we have our... I'm still going to say Director of Missions, although um, most of you know a DOM or you've heard of that, but they've got a new name, some sort of missionary strategist, evangelistic. You let him explain. <laughs> anyway, he'd like to come, and a lot of you know he knows, some of you he don't know, but he just kind of wants to talk to you about who he is and his role in the Kentucky Baptist or the Franklin County Association. So, Brother Doug Hamlin, if you would come on. And we're glad today he came because he brought his wife Kim with us and uh, with him today. And so we're we're thrilled to have her. A few people have told me they know your wife. Oh, well, you're okay. a little strange, but they know you your know, wife. I am strange. Yeah. God bless you, brother. And I did bring my wife. I always say she reminds me of a donut, uh, sweet and holy. <laughs> Y'all were worried, weren't you? <laughs> my name is Doug Hamlin, and I am your. It's called the Associational Mission Strategist. Yes, we used to be called Directors of Mission, but uh, Kentucky, well, KBC and the SBC, they, they kind of changed that name, and I like it, I have to say. Uh, first, though, I'd like to just uh, tell a little bit about myself. I am born and raised in Frankfort, Kentucky. Uh, yeah, I graduated from Western Hills. I was the first class to not go to Franklin County. So that kind of tells you how old I am. Um, so born and raised here, uh, except for a few little bit while I uh, went to the University of Kentucky. That's where I graduated, uh, my undergrad. Uh, and uh, then later, well, I'll say for 25 years, been in uh, the ministry. And spent about six, well, how many years? 16, 20 years in Henderson, Henderson, Kentucky. And about two years ago, just recently came back to Frankfurt as your AMS, Associational Mission Strategist. Now, here's why I like that title. Associational, that word is derived from a word that, that means family. Um, and it really, the connotation there is like more than one uh, joining together to become one, much like a wedding, right? Uh, where you have two different families and they join together and they become one family. And that's what we are here in the Franklin Baptist Association. We have 30 churches, including Calvary, uh, and we're all one family. We really are. In fact, uh, some of the things we've done, we've had a couple of churches that uh, one got affected by the flash flood here about however, three, four weeks ago, whenever that was, lost a, a whole wall of their church, was gone. Uh, but uh, some churches, we just joined together to help uh, them, help kind of raise funds, get some funds, uh, figure out who can put up a block wall and that type of thing. Uh, we've also had a church that um, they lost their heating and air. And we, all the association, we raised funds to uh, replace that, basically. So we're talking like five, $6,000. But even more than that, we've joined together uh, to do a mission trip. Um, in the title, associational. If the next word is mission, notice that that is singular. It's not missions, it's mission. Because we only have one mission. Amen. And that's the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything that I have, Jesus has commanded you. And of course, lo, I'm with you even to the end of the age. Uh, we uh, had an associational mission trip, went to Eastern Kentucky before the flooding, uh, and actually had great results. 
we thought we were going to be doing like backyard vacation Bible schools and things for grade school age. It turned out that that's what we planned and prepared for. It turned out they were middle school age. <laughs> so we had to change right on the fly. Long story short, nine of those individuals made professions of faith as a result of the association going and being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Uh, but I'm here this morning basically just to introduce myself and to bring you greetings from your other family, uh, the 29 other churches. And, uh, well, just being here, I can tell you we've been greeted by I don't know how many different people. I, I lost count, uh, which is a good thing. Yes. And it's just obvious to me that the Spirit is in this place. And now, along with you, I get to worship with you and hear one of the, our best pastors here in Franklin County. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Sister Terry, come on. I owe him now. Can I get in on this? Yeah, okay. sure. Right. Oh. She's blinding me again. All right. Uh, in the back of uh, the church on the podium, we have our new calendar. So please pick that up. I keep mine on my refrigerator so I can see uh, birthdays and anniversaries and activities that we have going on here at church. Uh, if you'll follow along in your bulletin, uh, one thing that's not in there, our cards are ready for the card ministry. They're ready to go out. They're there in the back. Please take one or even two, and send your words of encouragement and love to ones uh, who are in need. Uh, if you feel led to be an usher or a door greeter, there's a sign-up sheet for that in the back of the sanctuary, so please uh, look at that. The church voted at the last business meeting to send the Kentucky Baptist Disaster Relief Fund $1,000 for the Eastern Kentucky flooding disaster. If you'd like to make an additional contribution to that, Please do so by today. You can, it tells you there how to make out your check, put it in the offering plate, or give it to Sharon Britton up here in the pretty pink. Uh, she's our treasurer. Uh, and I noticed on the news the other night that uh, one of our teams has been dispatched to Florida to help out in their disaster relief. Uh, I'm going to move on down here. The Ladies' Friendship Circle at Peaks Mill Christian Church has invited our ladies to a salad supper, and it's on Thursday night, October the 27th at 6.30. Um, Cheryl got an invitation from them and included all of us. The thing is, is that we need to let them know by today how many we approximately would like that's going to attend this. Uh, you don't have to do anything but bring yourself they provide all the food and entertainment for that night. So if you'd like to participate in this particular event, there's a sign-up sheet for it in the back. So it's there at the back of the sanctuary, so please do that by today. I can't get my... I think David's using thicker paper. It doesn't want to turn on me. Um, as far as our men and women's shelter, I'm going to be calling them this week because, it, you know, as the weather is changing, their needs will change and we'll get a new list as far as what their fall and winter needs are. We're still collecting for our Eliza Broda State offering, so please be aware of that. Uh, our Bible study will be Tuesday at 1. This Wednesday night, we will have a specially called business meeting just for uh, voting on the budget. All right. About five minutes, Sharon says. He's do his and then he'll do his study afterwards. So it'll be a very short business meeting followed by a regular prayer meeting. Our homeless mats is on October 11th. And just note there, that's a new time because we have been meeting at 630. And on the 14th, we have our bonfire. And like I say, on the 27th, the Lady Salad Supper. And I'll just let you read the rest. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Boy, most of you are looking good this morning. <laughs> few of you, a little extra work would, wouldn't hurt. Uh, don't anybody point fingers. You know who you are. <laughs> you do realize, don't you, that 
uh, had Christ not risen from that grave, everything he had said and done to that point would have been a lie. But he did, didn't he? Amen. And we rejoice in the fact that he did. And the fact that he did, the fact that he lives even today, we can live because of that. Let's stand and begin our time of worship by singing, I live because he lives. in the fact that you live and that we can truly live the life that was destined for us because of what you did. Bless us in our time of worship. Let us see you clearly this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you have a seat? And as you do that, get a hold of a hymn book with me. And let's turn together to one that you will definitely know, 217. Oh, how I love Jesus.
uh, Kim, I didn't realize y'all had been gone that long. Kim and I worked together back in 1902. Uh, I'm just kidding. She's much younger than that. She was a baby. She was a baby. She was a baby. You know, at 3.30 this morning, 18 years ago, our mom passed away. And we had the pleasure of being with her, even though she was in Florida and had suffered an accident. All of us kids were able to be with her. Well, I don't want to get uh, sad because we were not raised in a home of sadness. We were raised in a home of rejoicing and love and laughter and everything. So to honor my mom this morning, I want to share this story with you. And I hope you enjoy it as much as I know she would. Forrest Gump died and went to heaven. That should be a laughter right there. He's at the pearly gates and St. Peter says, Well, come on in. It's certainly good to see you. We've heard a lot about you and I must tell you, the place is filling up quick. So we now have an entrance exam. Forrest goes, Oh, I didn't know anything about an exam. And he said, Well, there's only three questions. And he said, First question, What are the two days of the week that start with the letter T? Second question, how many seconds are there in a year? And, he, and the third question is, what is God's name? Forrest sort of stepped back a little bit, and you could see the wheels turning and him trying to figure out the answers to the questions. And uh, I lost my place. And he said, okay, Forrest, now that you have a chance to think it over, tell me your answers. And Forrest says, well, the first one, which days in the week begin with the letter T? He said, oh, that's easy. Today and tomorrow. <laughs> I can see St. Peter going, oh. um, And the saint opened his eyes and he says, Forrest, well, that's not what I was thinking, but you have a point. I guess that's okay. He said, how about the next one? How many seconds are there in a year? And he says, now that was a hard one, and I really had to think on this one. However, he said, there's 12. And St. Peter goes, 12? How do you get 12? January 2nd, February 2nd, March 2nd. He said, well, I guess you've got that one and that you've made your point on that one too. He said, but uh, let's go to the third and final question. Can you tell me God's first name? He said, oh, that one was easy. His name's Andy. He says, Andy? He said, yeah. He said, How do you, why do you call him Andy? He says, Andy walks with me. Andy talks with me. And St. Peter turned and said, run, force, run. <laughs> I think my mom would have enjoyed that. Don't you? Yeah. yeah. You all have a good day. I wish you had done the voice. Well, you know, I couldn't. <laughs> I can almost do the walk. You've heard it said, I'm sure, that you might be the only Jesus that somebody in your life sees. So it always bears us asking the question, what do people see when they look at me? Do they see Jesus in me? Can we stand together and sing? Let others see Jesus in you. Challenge for each of us. 571 is where you'll find it. <laughs>
God to bless our offering, please. Our most kind and gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord. Thank you for all the many blessings you've given us. Yes. Lord, I pray that you'll I pray that you'll be with us, that you'll pass, pass the offering. In the precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you. Uh, singing kind of sets the tone, doesn't it? And hear the music playing and all those different things that come out of that little bitty piano are amazing, aren't they? I'm glad to hear that. Well, how are you? I asked you a minute ago, you're still doing all right? All right, good. How many of you watching that clock? You're a Baptist, I know better than that. <laughs> watching that clock, looked in the offering plate, didn't you? Some of us thought about making change in the offering plate. I know how you are. 
I've actually seen that done. That's kind of funny, but yeah, make a change in the offering plate. You can always give God your best, can't you? How much does God give us? He gives us His best, doesn't He? You know, we have a lot of things that we like to say as believers or as Christians. You know, we're, we're confident that God has, get, God has given us His best. His Son was His best. Christ left glory, emptied of Himself of, of His glory, and came here to this earth, uh, lived in a poor family, and, and was crucified and died at the hands of men. And, and, you know, but I think a lot of times we might not think about all that He's done for us because, you know, it's easy to come in church. The correct answer is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Whatever's asked, Jesus is the answer. But then sometimes we get out into the world or we get out into Monday. Monday's a good day, right? And, and the answer's not always Jesus when things come into our life or, or especially when struggles come or something happens that you don't deserve. Have you ever had that happen? Something has come your way that you don't deserve. Now, I do, I've known some old fundamental pastors that would tell you straight up right off the bat, you deserve everything that happened to you. The Bible says that you deserve hell. And so they would always kind of bring you back to a humble place of, of, of thank you, Lord, or they would aggravate you one. But the truth of the matter is the things happen in our life that we don't feel like we deserve or shouldn't happen to us. And sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes we want to question God's intent on what he's doing in our life. And a lot of times we struggle with that. And so here we are in Acts 16 and, and we're in Philippi. And this is a Roman colony. And remember, to be a Roman colony was, was a great honor to have. And, and they had a lot of retired military there at Philippi. And that's one of the reasons why it was a Roman colony. And, and so Paul and them have come in and you realize there wasn't enough Jewish families there to have a synagogue. So they had a meeting place, a place of prayer down by the river. And we met Lydia there. And then we met the girl possessed of a spirit last week there. Um, and then, we, well, Paul and Silas cast out that spirit from that girl and made her handlers extremely upset because it cost them money. If you cost somebody money, they're going to get upset. Amen? I mean, that's just, that's still true today, isn't it? If you call somebody money, they're going to get upset. They're going to be overwhelmed with what's going on. So we kind of left it there where there was a stir in the city, where, where the, the people that had lost money stirred the city up by announcing that these men are Jews and they're teaching things that are unlawful for us Romans. Because, see, in a Roman colony, there, all of the religions that were practiced had to be recognized. Nothing new could be brought in. And so they were saying that these men are Jews, and that, that'll usually get everybody against you anyway. It's been that way since God created Abraham. Amen? People have been kind of turned against the Jews. and So I'm sure in Roman times it was probably just as much true. And these men are Jews. Well, that got everybody's attention. Uh, that means probably they could pick on them. And secondly, they're telling us things and, and bringing us things that are unlawful. They're, they're not allowed to do what they're doing. And so they got everybody stirred up. And that's where we're going to pick up the text this morning. So if you have your Bible, Acts 16, we're going to be looking... Well, let's look at about verse 20. It says, And when they had brought them in to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they're disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the innermost prison and fashioned their feet in the stocks. Let's pray. Father God, today I thank you that we can walk through your word that you gave us so many years ago. Father, I thank you for, um, for, for the life that Paul had and, and that Silas had and that Timothy had and Luke had and, and how we can look back and see what they did following you. Father, we thank you for those early believers in Philippi. And Father, that, that there was a church that was established there because of this missionary endeavor of Paul. Father, I pray you'll help us to learn today Looking at Paul and Silas in their life, the things that we can understand about the joy that they had. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. So here we have Paul and, Paul and Silas. 
thrown into the prison, just like I said they were going to be, I read ahead, and they were thrown into prison, and, and, and they were thrown into stocks. And so let's, let's get the picture here. They were thrown in the innermost prison. Now, in a lot of Roman prisons, sometimes you had an upper level and a lower hewn out level down in the stone with a hole that you could let the prisoners down into this inner darker chamber that was underneath cut out of stone. Now, but most of them weren't that way. Most of them had an inner room. So they had like things around the outside that on the inside there would be more cells. But then the innermost cell with no light whatsoever, no window, no anything, well guarded would be another place to throw the prisoners that you want to keep hold of. And so we have a picture here that Paul and Silas, what are they doing? They're preaching. They freed a slave girl of the demonic influence in her life and people got upset. They brought liberty and freedom to her and she was in her right mind and people got upset because money was more important than people. People haven't changed very much, have they? Money's still more important than people most of the time. Uh, I remember back in the old days you hear stories of the miners, the donkey or the mule was more important than the miner. You can get another man, but the, but the mule was expensive. And it's still that way in a lot of situations today where people just don't matter as much as the money does, as the revenue does. And, and we, we've got our, our focus completely off when we get that way. And so they're thrown into this inner prison and they're suffering because of something they did that was good. They were preaching the Lord Jesus Christ and His deliverance from sin and how He was superior to Moses and that their only way to be saved was to, was to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Same thing that we preach today and people didn't want to hear it. Now Lydia wanted to hear it. And, and probably a few others wanted to hear it because there's, there was a church that was begun there at Philippi. But the general people of Philippi didn't want to hear this. They didn't want this new religion because in their mind they were all equal. You could have as many gods as you wanted. You could have as many different religions as you, as you wanted. And you could actually take part in all of those religions. And a lot of people did. They did whatever any, any different religion required even to the point of burning incense to Caesar as, as a deity. They would burn incense to Caesar as a deity. They were expecting everybody to just kind of do it all. But... But the disciples of Christ come along and they tell people there's only one God. His name is Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes unto the Father but by me. Now, that still kind of messes with people's minds today. Because they want there to be many ways to heaven. They want many ways to make God happy or to please Him. And Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Very narrow-minded, our Master. Amen? So we follow Him. We're as narrow-minded as he is. Paul was as narrow-minded. So Paul was preaching Jesus as the only way. He delivers this young girl. Him and Silas wind up in jail. And then it says in the text that we just read that they were beat. They, they, the magistrates stripped them of their clothes and beat them with rods. Now it was common that day, my understanding is reading other people, that they would walk around ready to beat people with these rods. I mean, just the, that's kind of how the police were. Um, the police today walk around with instruments of defense too, don't they? So they walk around with these rods and they were able to, to beat them on the spot. And so they bring the magistrates in. They bring them in before the magistrates and the magistrates and everybody just loses their mind. You can imagine it just went crazy quickly. So the magistrates run up and rip the, rip the clothes off the back of Paul and Silas. And these guys begin to whip them with these rods. And, and these rods were, were made for, a, for this, this purpose completely. Now I have read that some of these rods had like an axe head near them or in the middle of them. <coughs> so that if the pronouncement or the sentence was worse... They could just go ahead and end the sentence right now. I don't know how much of that's true. But here we have Paul and Silas, good guys, right? Doing the will of the Lord, right? Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and accused of something that they really weren't doing. They were preaching Jesus. It doesn't matter what the laws of the land are, we preach Jesus. Amen? If, if they pass the law tomorrow that says you can no longer preach or pray in the name of Jesus Christ, what are we going to do? We're going to preach and we're going to pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our churches will get smaller. Because people don't like that kind of conflict. But they will get stronger because conflict always makes the church stronger. It just does. Persecution makes the church stronger. And so here we are in Philippi. They're thrown into prison. Something they did not do. And they're thrown in. And I want you to look what happens there in verse 25. 
So they're in there in, the, in their stocks. Now the stocks, that means their feet. And I was going to demonstrate. I thought, I, you know, when, when you're in stocks, your feet are, are stuck inside a big wooden block. Now in this day, they had stocks that had five holes in it. Two for your feet, two for your wrist, one for your neck. Now they'd never fold me up and get me in stocks like that. One the time they got me folded like that, I would no longer be breathing because if, if I tried to do that right now, I can't breathe. But, but, but they had Paul and Silas's feet in stocks, which kept them from escaping. It's, it's a huge block of wood with holes carved in it that closes together with iron around it so that they can't move. And Paul and Silas are in stocks because these guys were, were causing a disturbance. So, so they've had their jackets or their cloaks ripped off their back They've had their backs beaten with rods. They're, they're bloodied. They're swollen. They, they've been beat. Who knows? They may have broken bones and their feet are in stocks. And they're on the ground in the inner chamber at midnight. How would you feel? I mean, let's be honest. How would you feel? So you can imagine, here's Paul and Silas. Just like that. Feet spread out in the stocks, in the inner chamber, and it's midnight. It's been a long day. They haven't eaten. They haven't had anybody take care of their wounds. How long can you sit up? So it's midnight. Most people, most decent people, over the age of 25 are sleeping. Well, how do you sleep? Laying down. How many of you side sleepers? Yeah, it ain't happening tonight. You ain't side sleeping tonight. Your feet are in the stocks. After a certain point, you can't sit up any longer. Now, what are you laying on when you lay like this? On the back that has broken bones and busted skin and swollen and blood and you still haven't eaten and it's midnight so it's dark yeah. <laughs> and you're laying on your back in the dark on the bruises in the blood with your feet in stops <laughs> how many of you are happy at this point <laughs> celebrating right yeah. well here's the, where the story gets weird inside this prison there are many, many, many other prisoners. Y'all were wondering if I could get up, right? <laughs> How many of you are going to come help me? You ready? Yeah. I positioned myself to where I could pretty easily, if nothing else, scooch over to the edge of the, side, the steps. But I get up and down more often than you may think. So here they are, it's midnight, they're locked in these stocks, they're on their back, they're, 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 they're bloody, they're bruised, they're beaten, they're hungry, and they're surrounded by other prisoners that are just absolutely, probably deserve to be in there, maybe not all of them. But I mean, you're around some pretty bad people when you're locked inside the prison of a pretty good sized town like Philippi. And so the, the verse says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing. Praying and singing. Now I want you to understand these are not two actions. The way this is constructed in, in, in the original writings is while they're praying, they're also singing. It's, it's an ongoing thing. So, so they're praying. What do you reckon they're praying for? Relief? Release? I wonder if maybe they're praying for the jailer that put them in there. See, sometimes we don't think like we should think when we are faced with the way the early Christians think. We think they think crazy. We look at that and we go, what? I want to have, I'm an American citizen. I'm a citizen of heaven. How many of you use that card? I'm God's child. You're not going to talk to me that way. Paul and Silas weren't that way at all. They were on their back. All those things going on. And they were in prayer... Because they couldn't sleep. You're not going to sleep on the floor in the dungeon with the bare back. Even if they put the clothes back on, that's not going to help much, is it? They're hungry. They've been beat. 
They're in stocks. They can't roll over. They can't stand up. They can't do anything. Once I got down on the ground with my feet in the stocks, I'm going to stay there because I don't know that I could do a sit-up with my feet spread out straight out in front of me. I'm stuck in that position until somebody else gets me up. And they're laying there with all this going on, wrongly accused, wrongly attacked, and they're praying and singing. Now, there are several people down through the years that have, that have suggested what they were singing, probably something out of the Psalms or something like that, but they were singing hymns to God. We, we don't have a feeling that they're singing funeral dirges. We don't have a feeling that their woe is me it for a little while. You know, they're not, they're not pulling from their blues repertoire of, of music of, of, of a good guy feeling down. That, that, that wasn't what... They were singing praises to Almighty God while they lie on their back, bloody and bruised and whipped and accused, and they don't know that they're ever going to get out because they may be killed the next morning. We know the rest of the story. They don't. And they're praising God on their back. They're in the bonds of joy. You, you, you see, Paul and Silas' captivity was not the jail cell. Paul and Silas' captivity was not what was done to them. Paul and Silas' captivity was what Christ has done for them. They were captured by the love of Christ. As a matter of fact, Paul writes in a later place and he says, we are constrained by the love of Christ to do what we do. It's the same thing that's got them on their back in the middle of a jail cell. They're constrained by the love of Christ that they're overflowing with joy. Isn't that weird? I mean, it's a little bit weird, let's be honest. I look out there and I've seen some grumpy faces before and the only thing that happened was your, coast, your toast was burnt this morning. <laughs> Coffee was cold. Somebody got in front of you on the way here and you're having a bad day. How many of you have ever, ever had a bad day because of something somebody else did? Yeah. Right? And it lasted, didn't it? I mean, it, you can have a bad day, you can have a bad week because somebody was snarky. You went to check out or you went to order something and they it's like they don't have time for you. And you got offended, got your little feelings hurt, and it ruins your day. That's because you're not constrained by the joy of Christ. You're more constrained by your own peace of mind and your own ego. Now think about Paul, who he is. Think about Silas and who he is and what's gone on with them. And yet laying in that floor in the middle of the night, they were singing and praising and praying to Almighty God. You see, they didn't let the situation affect their joy. They didn't have situational joy. Where did they get their joy? Anybody ever talk about joy? Ever think about joy? The, oh, the joy of seeing your grandchild open a gift on Christmas, right? Mm, and I don't doubt that that's not pure joy. I've watched my own children open gifts on Christmas, and it gave me joy. And that kind of joy comes and goes. I mean, and, and there's sometimes there's, there's joy or happiness. Happiness you're never guaranteed. Uh, but joy is something that we're told we have. But, but, but joy is one of those things that... Now, now Paul, you, where are we at? We're in Philippi. You know, there's another book a little bit later on called Philippians. Written to the church at Philippi. And it's the book, he's in prison then too. And he's writing back to these people at Philippi. And it, this book has rejoice and praise in it more than any other book. For its size, just a couple of chapters. And it's full of rejoice and praise. And, and I pray this for you that my joy could be full. And he's in another prison. Joy, Paul understood joy differently than a lot of people today. If your joy can be shipwrecked quick, situation. Situation. I had to do a study on, on the word situational and circumstance. Situation, circumstance. Because a lot of people say, well, they're the same. Well, they're really kind of not because you have a little bit of power in a situation. 
And the situation may become about because of circumstances that are in your life. A circumstance is circum. They, they, they're kind of all the way around. You're called into a lot of things and it may call, create different circumstances uh, or situations in your life. And so first of all, his joy wasn't circumstantial. It wasn't, you know, they were arrested. I, I've got a list I actually wrote down. They Listen, what happened to them, and they still had joy, that here's the situation they're in. They were unlawfully beaten. They were arrested. They were bleeding. They were cold. They were in bonds. And they were treated unfairly. That'll get you put under the jail nowadays. That's not fair. Well, there's really no such thing as fair. We hold on to that, don't we? Their situation was awful. And they had joy. It wasn't situational. Our joy should not be situational either. We shouldn't just have joy because things are going good. Or our joy shouldn't be fleeting because something bad has happened. Because the worst thing that can happen to you any day of any year does not knock Christ off the throne. Amen? He's still on the throne and He's still good no matter how much bad I perceive comes into my life. So if my reason for joy is seated in the heavenlies with Christ, then no matter what happens in my life, my joy is there. Complicated. Not easy at all. Not only is it not situational, but it's not circumstantial. Listen, their, their circumstances, which means it was beyond their control, something they had no influence on. They were on an inner cell. They were locked in stocks. They, they were bloody. They hadn't eaten. They were tied down. They couldn't do anything about the situation. They couldn't do anything about the circumstances that this happened in. They, the situation was they was preaching something somebody accused them of. And that's a situation they had control of. They didn't have to preach. They didn't have to be out proclaiming Christ. They didn't have to do these things. It was a situation they found themselves in because of the call. But that created these circumstances that now the world is against them. They've thrown them into jail. They want to shut them down. They've cost people money. And they're going along for the ride. And there's nothing they can do about it. They still have joy. They still have joy. But I want you to see something else in this text. They don't only have joy. They also have peace and love. How many of you have heard of those three? Mm-hmm. Peace, love, and joy, right? i got a friend of mine in Maysville that when I, when I call him or greet him or text one another, it's peace, love, and joy. It's how he says goodbye. Peace, love, and joy. Isn't that good stuff? Peace, love, and joy. Listen what, listen what it goes on and says. So here's their joy. They're singing and praising God at midnight. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. Oh, before that it says, and the prisoners were listening to them. I want you to understand that it says the prisoners were listening to them. It wasn't because they were also in jail with them that they had to hear the sound. The word here means that they were paying attention to what Paul and Silas were saying in their prayers and in their praises. So, so there was a witness involved. There was a witness involved in what they were doing. They were listening and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everybody's bonds were unfastened. How many would say hallelujah? Amen. Our God is able, right? How many of you be gone in the next moment? I'm telling you, I'm running. I'm gone. Paul knew something different though. He says, when the jailer woke, I've, I've, I've read a lot of people that said the jailer was listening to them sing and pray and, and all of a sudden when, when all this happened and they didn't run, he wanted to get saved. It says he, he, was awoke, he was woke up by the earthquake. He'd been asleep. Now there's a good chance that his house was right there on the premises and, and but everything that happened in there, he was kind of like the guy over it all. If anything bad happened, it all fell on his shoulders. So it says that when, when the bonds... Everybody's bonds run fast, and when the jailer woke, so he'd been sleeping through all that, and saw the prison doors were open, he's on sight. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. So it t- shows you the responsibility of the jailer. He's probably going to be killed anyway, because all these prisoners have escaped. He, he woke up, he looked, the doors are all open, it's dark, it's midnight, and he thinks they've all run away, because that's what he would have done. And he, he begins to, he gets his sword out and he's going to unalive himself. I didn't realize until I'm studying about Philippi that that was common in Philippi to unalive yourself. 
there was, there's so much history about Philippi. Uh, Brutus was there, took his life while he was there. Several other people have lost battles and they were there. They took their life while they were there. It was a common thing. It's almost like the demons had a hold of these people in Philippi and it was a common thing to do. So the, so the jailer runs in and he sees the doors are open, understands that in the blackness that the cages are, are, are open and so the inmates are loose. And he begins to prepare to take his own life. He begins to prepare to take his own life. And what do we hear? I love this. Do no harm to yourself, for we are all here. Think about that. Paul's speaking not only for him and Silas, but for the other prisoners too that have been listening to him sing and listening to him preach. They was having a tent meeting, chained up inside a dungeon, and the, and the Holy Spirit was working in people's lives so much so. You ever been to a preaching service that when the preacher says, well, it's about time for us to be dismissed, you go, no, not now. I haven't experienced it here lately. But I have been to those where you just don't want it to end. I mean, the, the Holy Spirit's moving and the preacher's preaching and the, the, the place is alive and there's fellowship and there's enjoyment. And they say, well, we're going to have to break. We'll meet back here again tomorrow night. You know, let's, let's just go on and go on. And, and we see that. I mean, Paul must have been that kind of preacher because, you know, at one point he's preaching. There's this young guy in a second story window sitting there. Paul preaches so long, people begin to fall asleep. He fell out of the window and fell down and died. That's some long-winded preaching. Now you know his mom and dad. That's your fault, Paul. But Paul went down there and laid on him, prayed over him, and the boy woke up. He said, he ain't dead. He's just asleep. And what did he do? He said, well, we've had one close call. Let's go home. No! Went up there and preached till the sun came up. I have been to those kind of meetings where the Holy Spirit is moving, where the Word of God's being preached and the Spirit's moving in people's lives. You're like, I don't want to leave here. Well, this is exactly what's happened. Paul and Silas, God has anointed them with that kind of powerful preaching and prayer. And they're just being who they are. They've got joy in their life, even though it's the worst thing going on. And these hardened criminals, these other guys, have never heard anybody singing from the prison house. And they're singing because they're full of the joy of Christ. They're constrained by the love of God and the joy of Christ. That their situation and their circumstances did not affect their joy. Oh, don't you want to walk in those sandals? Wouldn't that be great that your situation and your circumstances doesn't affect your joy? But it also doesn't affect, it doesn't affect their peace. Earthquake happens. There was some rumbling. There was some shaking. They're in the inner. The doors open and the chains fall off. And, and here they are. They could have got out of the stocks at any point. Them and the other prisoners. And when it does settle and it got quiet again, the jailer runs in. He says, I've lost them all. And they were just taking a breath. They were going to continue their revival. They were all there. Paul said, do thyself no harm. For we are all here. There's love. There's love. You think, Paul, if, if it were you, would you think maybe the jailer deserves a, a sword to the abdomen? I mean, after all, he was part of the beating. He was part of the locking you up. He was part of putting you in the stocks. He was, he was a part of all that. He was, a, he was a part of the reason why you're suffering. He's part of the reason why you're hurting. He's part of the reason why you haven't been fed. He's part of the reason that you're not happy at this moment. But Paul loved him enough to say, Oh, please don't hurt yourself. You're worth more than that. See, that's a love that is not affected by circumstances. That's a love and a peace and a joy that's not affected by situations that you find yourself in. These, these are things that are part of our Christian walk. You know, you don't have to lose your joy. It was the gift to you from Jesus Christ. You don't have to let go of it. You can hang on to your joy. You say, well, how do I hang on to my joy? How do I hang on to my love? How, how do I hang on to my peace? Well, if it's anchored in Christ, if, if the reason why you have peace is because you, you know your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You know that Christ died for you. and He called your name one day and you replied, 
Here am I, Lord. And, and you know that you're saved beyond measure. You know you're going to die one day, but you know you're going to spend eternity in God's home. Amen? When, when, when you're anchored in that, there's peace. There's peace no matter the circumstances. You know that there's a good God and He's watching over you and that at any moment you could leave this world and, and it's okay. Paul, Paul didn't care. He went out and preached knowing he was going to die at some point. He didn't care. He just went and preached until it was time for him to go home. Because his peace was anchored in what Christ had done on the cross. Not only his peace, but his joy. He had joy in a prison cell. I dare you to try that. I mean, just try it in your own living room. How many of you like being held down? You imagine having your legs in stocks where you can't move at all? I mean, you try that. Go home, stick your legs under the couch where you can't move them. Lay on your back on the carpet. It may feel good for a while, but after a while, that hurts, doesn't it? Imagine hours and hours and hours of that, and then, and then start singing. Start singing, start praising. I, I'm telling you, Paul, Paul, Paul had a hold of what it is that, that, that anchors your joy in such a place that it cannot be taken from you. Men can take your happiness. They can, they can steal that for a moment because a lot of times we anchor our happiness in stuff. Right? Happiness comes and goes. Joy is rooted in who Jesus is, but more than that, who you are in Him. Ephesians says that we are seated with Christ in the heavenlies, and that's present tense. That's right now. How many of you feel like you're sitting in heaven? Well, it doesn't really feel that way, but that's a Bible truth. That should change your attitude about how you live. You're seated with Christ in the heavenlies. He is our, we're joint heirs with Christ, the Bible says. We have, we have, our joy is anchored in the fact that we're related to Jesus. We're adopted. We already have the spirit of adoption in our life. Paul got that. You understand that? Paul got it. Paul got things on a different level than a lot of us do. Because, you know, we, we, we like to complain. We like to be... Now, he wasn't always kind or easy to get along with. I think Paul was a little bit abrasive. But, man, I sure would have been rather tied, tied to him in a jail cell. Because he had faith. Can you imagine that kind of worship service? Paul says, well, we're lying here. So let's sing. Might as well sing. Can you imagine? Next time somebody stubs their toe around you, say, you're hurting bad, we might as well sing. See how that goes over. <laughs> Hit their thumb with a hammer. Hurting bad? Might as well sing. It ain't happening. The song we sing when we hit ourselves with a hammer is usually not a song we like to repeat inside him. Paul had a joy that could not be shaken. It was anchored in who he was in Christ. He had a love that even though this guy had mistreated him, he cared for him because of the love of Christ. Even though these bad things had happened, he had love, he had peace, and he had joy anchored in Christ. And I want to tell you today, you can too. You got things in your life shipwrecking your faith. You got things in your life shipwrecking your joy. You got things in your life that steal your, steal your peace. You got things in your life that steal your love for, for your fellow man. Those things are where you're anchored. If they can rock your boat, you're not anchored where you need to be anchored. You need to be anchored in the captain of our salvation. His name is Jesus Christ. And your place in Him, your, your standing in Him, even though our state is still here on this earth, our standing in Him should bring us love, peace, and joy. How many of you desire just a little bit more of all three of those in your life? Yeah. It's found in Jesus. It's found in trusting Him and relying upon Him no matter the situation, no matter the circumstances. And not only, not only that, but it's unconditional. 
God doesn't look down at you later and say, well, you didn't behave like I wanted you to yesterday. I no longer love you. Our love, our joy, our peace should be unconditional as well. Because God never changes. Amen? Amen. Shouldn't be situational, circumstantial, or it should be unconditional. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll have a time of, of invitation. I'd like to give you an opportunity this morning to respond to what has been preached. If the Spirit of God has moved in your life and you're thinking, you know what? My peace is just a little bit too easily lost. Or, or my joy is just a little bit too easily taken from me. Maybe, maybe this would be a good day to, to just kind of lock back down. on. You know, the, Paul said the love of Christ constrained him to do what he did. He was motivated and moved because God loved him so much. So many people I know today do what they do about a fear of God rather than the love of God. We're afraid God's going to beat us on the head or if I don't do this, He's going to get me. It's, it's flipped over of that. He loves you so much He came and died for you. And He desires for you to have His peace, His joy, and His love. And if we'll strive to walk in that, if, we, if we'll strive to spend time in His Word and in prayer and getting to know Him greater, we'll see these things in our life as well. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank You. Thank You. Thank You. I pray now that You'll just speak into our lives. That, Father, if we need to move, if we need to realize something, if we need to bow the knee and pray, if we need to come and seek You in a greater way, if we need to, whatever we need to do, Father, in this few moments of invitation, I pray that You'd move upon our life. Father, I pray that you'll be with us as we reflect on who we are and where we're at. Father, may we see you greater in our life. Father, may, may the things that I've said today, Father, disappear if they're, if they're motivated or, or not correct to your word. But Father, may your word, may it, may it take lodging in our lives and may it bring forth fruit in our lives this day. Thank you for the priest's word. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.